How many of you went shopping this week? Had to buy something in a store? Maybe you searched online for something and were looking at the item description. Okay, now, how many of you watched a commercial this week? Okay, I think I've hit most of us now. (laughs) If not, I, I guess you'll have to tell me what you did that applies to this scenario. When you're shopping and you're looking online, how many of you notice the words new and improved? Or something to that nature. Now with... Me, you know, this, uh, this idea, have you, do you recognize that? We uh, bought uh, maybe cereal because, well, now it's made with better marshmallows <laughs> in it. Or uh, you went and you bought uh, uh, Nutri-Grain bars because, well, now you realized, you know, I should probably just stop eating the, the hostess cakes for breakfast and I should go and do something else because I want to be better for my health. And and so you're looking at these products and you're seeing maybe laundry detergent. This is like the number one thing I think I hear over and over and over on commercials now with grass stain fighters. And it's like, well, I don't know, maybe elbow grease or baking soda and vinegar. Maybe that's, maybe that's really the key. But over and over and over again, you will hear the words new and improved to get you to buy their products. Um, every time there's a new vehicle that comes out, you have to ask, well, why would I trade my old one? And so they will sell you on something new to get you to say, yeah, I, I need that. Now, some of these, when you're going and shopping, even if they haven't changed anything, how many of you have seen manufacturers put on their products, same old thing? You, you just, you don't see that, do you? <laughs> it, it's funny, actually. So now over, over time, you know, we get used to this idea, well, I need something newer, better, I'm, I'm older, I've learned more, and so things should work better. Entire careers are built around just this idea of how can I take this product and make it better? Or how can I take the systems that are currently in place and make them better? How can I make them more efficient? How can I get more about it? How can it be a better an experience? And so I want you to keep this in mind a little bit as we dive into Hebrews chapter 8, because you're going to hear this term, new, uh, the word uh, superior, better, covenant. And, and I know these illustrations, they do, they break down, and it's really just to kind of grab our attention. This is, let me be honest, it's just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page and, and everybody woke up from our time of communion, or if you somehow got lost, you're now back at looking at Hebrews chapter 8, and we're all on the same page here. But Hebrews, again, if you've not been with us, written to a Jewish audience who at some point has left Judaism, they've left their Jewish faith, and they've come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. But now they're questioning their faith and and looking back into, well, Judaism and the practices there. There's a whole lot of reasons why. We won't get into those now. But he's been addressing the high priest in Judaism, and he's been contrasting the Aaron um, and Mosaic law and covenant and how the high priest came to be through there and how Jesus was a high priest not according to that law, that condition, but he is part of a more superior uh, high priest, and his temple of, is of a superior nature to that priesthood. And so we come to Hebrews chapter 8, and we see in verse 1 it says, now the point in what we're saying is this, which really should just grab our attention. Like, now we're going to get it. Unfortunately, as 21st century American Christians, Gentiles, we're still going to be like, I'm not sure I'm still getting the point, but... He's going to do it, and I believe it's valuable for us. It says, We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were... On earth, 
he would not be a priest at all since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. And so in this reference, this little section of scripture right here, he's comparing and contrasting what we looked at a couple weeks ago. Melchizedek, you might remember the comparison that was taking place and how Jesus was not a Levite. And so therefore he that meant that he could not serve as a priest according to the Levitical code and law that everybody had been practicing under and placing their lives under. But Jesus did serve as a high priest in a greater priesthood. And so we see this comparison taking place. And he began to lay out the comparison of the priesthood. And then in chapter 8, he's going to dive deeper into this comparison, not just between the priesthood, but of the old covenant and the new covenant. And he's been doing this systematically throughout the, his whole beginning point of the, of the book of Hebrews. And he's beginning to now start to apply everything that he's been saying. Hey, you know uh, the angels. Oh, you know the prophets. You know Moses. You know Aaron. Here's why all of this that you are familiar with is still worthwhile, yet is just a picture or a foreshadowing of the new covenant that God has established through Christ. And so he starts off, again, looking at the temple or the place of worship that these Jewish uh, followers would have placed as, well, like we do, the church. We gather here in a central location. We give our tithes and our offerings. We experience times of sacrifice and service and maybe even conversation, who knows. Maybe it's a joy to sit in the altar and worship together as one body. But he begins to compare and contrast this temple. And the high priests they were accustomed to, who he serves a temporary temple. And then he says, but Jesus serves in an eternal place. There's a compare and contrast. And so if we look at this, where did the temple come from? Where, well, we see in the beginnings when God gave the directions for the tent that the Israelites would take up and take down and then set back up and they'd follow that pillar of fire and they'd follow that pillar of cloud and wherever it stopped, they'd stop and they'd break out their suitcases again and they'd, they'd put all the temple back up together and then when the pillar of clouds and fire started moving again, well, hey, we got to tear it down. And so they tear it all down, pack it all up, and then put it, haul it along, and oh, stop. Set it back up, let's go. And so this is what was happening, the tent, and there was very specific instructions given for this tent, for this temple, as we would see later in Solomon's day. Very specific instructions. And uh, this is significant it's a foreshadowing, though, and we'll, we'll mention this in just a few minutes. This tent was set up by man's hands. Uh, but the temple, the tent that the writer of Hebrews is going to address and remind them of is that Jesus and the one that God is building is not done by human hands, but by the God of eternity himself. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. Kids especially, okay? So <clears throat> if I said, now I'm not, a, I'm not a, a toy builder by any means, but if I said I was going to build you or give you a toy, something that you would always long for, okay, you wanted it, and I said, I think I can do that for you. I can build that for you. And I put it together with the best of my abilities with these two human hands and maybe some power tools. I mean, who, who can't do a project without power tools, right? So you put that together, you hand it, I hand it off to you. You might say, well, gee, this is nice. <laughs> or you might say, wow, that's great. However, if I had said, now let me tell you, either I can do it or the one who has created all can build you something very specific. So your every heart's desire and whims and wishes, every minute detail with extreme care. Now, whose toy would you really want? It's okay to answer. Would you want mine? No, no, of course not. 
uh, that's, by the way, you're not offending me, because that is the right answer. This is, what, this is what God has done. He has taken, and he's trying to compare and contrast the tent built by human hands, even following godly instructions, great detailed instructions, is still not a completely, you know, there's just a better builder, and his name is God Almighty. Um, the, when we look at this old covenant, we see just everything that was taking place, the tent specifically, why they did what they did, how they served, what they did. The, they would serve as a mediator between God and his people. And, and wouldn't, don't we want what God is building versus what we ourselves can build don't we want to know that Jesus Christ is our mediator before God himself rather than, well, just me or, or you going before God? We want, we want God himself to be part of this. And, and so this is the same with the temple, serving inside, worship, all the practices uh, that took place, the priesthood of Aaron, while they made sacrifices for others, they also had to make sacrifices for themselves, it states, they would enter with the gifts that they were directed to by the law, and all of these sacrifices were to seek God's forgiveness, to worship him, and remind the people that, well, sin has a consequence, which again, we'll dive in later just a little bit. But all of this, according to the tradition of Judaism, Christ would not have been a part of all of this system. He points to a better System, something we've already talked about, and yet we'll uh, continue on in verse 5. And, and so when Moses meets God on Mount Sinai, we can read about that in Exodus chapter 19 and 20 and following. Um, and just as a side note, man, I wonder exactly how that experience went. <laughs> it, I mean, I see the response of the people down below where they're experiencing the mountain shaking and the thundering and, and just, they were in fear. And yet Moses was, was there interacting with God. I just can't imagine what he saw. Because in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5, it actually tells us that uh, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. Now, I'm a visual learner myself. I, when I read something, I have to go back and read it again. If I have a picture with it, it cements it in just a little bit better. And if and if, then if I can actually do it with somebody while I'm watching something, well, then that's, that's even greater. But this idea of Moses is on the mountain, and he's given, God has given him the law and how to set up the tent. And I don't know why I've never seen it this way before, but it's, the text here says, God tells Moses, do it according to what you have seen, what I have shown you. And I just stand back, and I'm like, I wonder what he actually saw. And why, I guess maybe this leads to why I understand a little bit more of why he was so frustrated with the people. Because he had been able to see what God told him to build and what the people were to build and what they were supposed to do. He was able to see it and then tried to do it. <laughs> It feels a little bit like me trying to look at a picture of something and then trying to draw it. I mean, you've maybe seen this. Uh, an artist has somebody sit on a pedestal or a chair or whatever, or they have a basket of fruit out on a table, and they're looking at it and they're seeing it. And then they try to transfer that with all the detail and all of the intricacies of the real thing right before them to what they're, what they're going to try to do on, on canvas. or and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a picture, a word picture in my mind that just 
brings me to awe, really, of what God has done, and yet just how limited what that true tent really looks like in relationship to what God is doing and what he has already done. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's extremely, uh, that word serves as a copy and a shadow, and that, that's, that's significant. So again, kids, real quick, pay attention, all right? There, there, I saw some heads come back. All right, so if you're looking for your mom and your dad in the grocery store because you've been distracted by the new and the approved or extra utility belt that this character has or whatever it is. So you're distracted and you look up that your parents have now left. They've left you at the store. They've gone home. That's, that's right. They, just, they told you they were leaving. They meant it this time. So you realize they're not there and you begin to panic for just a minute. And so, oh no, I'm left. <laughs> And you begin to go and look down the end of the aisle, and you think you see them, but you're not quite sure. And so then you go to the next aisle, but they're not there. And you begin searching and searching, and you're not quite seeing them, but maybe there's, you begin to feel this emotion of fear, and then you notice maybe the shadow on the floor behind you. Now, sometimes that's not a great feeling, because it means you're in trouble, but there would also be this feeling of relief. Now, the other question that I would ask you, kids, is this. Would you rather see just a shadow of your parents in that moment? Or would you rather want to actually see your parent standing before you? The real thing. This is the picture that I think the writer of Hebrews is trying to draw our attention to. Technology has helped us in this area, but still a copy of the original It'll lose its detail, its luster. A picture of a loved one. I can do something to remind you. But there's nothing like the real thing. This is the point I think the writer is trying to meet. We have our God who is named our Father in heaven who has given us a glimpse and a foreshadowing of what he desires for us in worship. A desire for us when it comes to obedience and surrender And everything that we've been able to see is just simply a copy or a a picture, a glimpse of the eternity and the perfection and the detail that he desires for each and every one of us to see. And in this moment, he's trying to remind those followers of Christ who have left Judaism who are tempted to go back to saying that picture is what I want more. And the writer's trying to remind them, no, that picture is rubbish (laughs) in comparison to what God has intended for you to see in eternity. In Hebrews uh, chapter 8, verse 6, it tells us, that, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Now, often when we read this passage, we see that word fault and we see better and we begin to see this, this uh, automatic connection of, well, we just want to throw away then that which has come before it. We begin to classify that which has come before the new covenant as worthless junk. And I want to encourage you to not do that with the old covenant, especially. But while it mentions this new covenant is, well, new and better and excellent, The reason the new covenant is better isn't because the old covenant was worthless. 
It was ineffective not because God faulted, but because we did. Verse 9 will bring this out. So let's, um, let's read that. This is actually a quote from Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, verses 31 and 34. And so I'm going to encourage you, if you want to read it here in Hebrews, you can. If you want to flip to Jeremiah, you can. And then I'm going to actually read it together, both of these, just so you can hear it a couple times. But in Hebrews 8, verse 8, it says, For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God And they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Now, I'm going to read Jeremiah 31, 31 and 34, and you can just listen for the slight slight, uh, nuances that may be different, but just the complete Uh, consistency that we see in the message. It says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor, and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Again, the writer here is appealing to their knowledge of history, even our knowledge of history. But as it might be with the cases as pertaining to us, our history lessons, just as I think theirs were, sometimes get to be a little bit fuzzy. We tend to remember history maybe not as well as maybe the actual events happened. And maybe we don't remember the details as we should in order to keep us warned and on the right path. They may have remembered the words of Jeremiah. Uh, They would have uh, remembered the great account of God, I believe, leading them out of the land of Egypt. I I believe they held dearly to this covenant and the idea of this covenant that was established on Mount Sinai between God and them. But it says they failed to remember that. They couldn't keep it, and that their their forefathers didn't keep it. And so our writer here in Hebrews brings out that it's not the old covenant that was at fault, but it's that the people were at fault. See, sometimes we get in a danger of comparison and contrasting and pitting one covenant against the other, and we begin to ask the question, well, Why did God mess up like that if he knew we couldn't keep it? (laughs) And I think really that's the wrong question, first of all. But I think the real point is that it is a foreshadowing and a copy of what God desires for us in worship and ultimately a foreshadowing and a copy of what God would do for us in the new covenant. Because just as these commands are, were written down on stone tablets and they were to read and they were supposed to put within their minds and their hearts, and sometimes we look at those things merely as historical documents now, the new covenant also has laws and commands that are written down, but 
rather than on parchment or stone on our hearts, within us, our hearts and our minds, connecting the two most uh, representative of our entire being, emotionally and thought and discernment, wisdom. And just as God promised in the old covenant to be their God, <laughs> and that those people would, would be his people, if they would obey, their, obey the laws and submit to the Lord God, that part of the covenant is still the same. Because God calls us into relationship with Christ to, to surrender to him. And that as we come to him and surrender, that under this banner of Christ, we are his people. The covenant terms really sound the same, don't they? And that's by design. And what the law attempted to do in helping people know God and worship God, Jeremiah tells us again that this new covenant that God would establish would lead to us being able to know God from the least to the greatest. It kind of sounds like everybody, doesn't it? This invitation is for all. And what the law attempted to do in showing mercy and forgiveness of sins well, the new covenant would display in full power. And it would continue to do in a greater way. And so the old covenant is a copy and a shadow, a foreshadowing of that which God has done, not because he was in error, but because we are. And so in verse 13, it says, In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. And so when Jesus came and proclaimed about the kingdom of heaven, and when Jesus came and offered himself to be the perfect sacrifice, he was bringing a greater fulfillment and a greater understanding of the interaction that God desired for his people. The law and his practices, again, are a foreshadowing or a copy of what God had in mind for worship even for us today and in eternity. And the Jewish believers really needed this encouragement not to give up. Not to give up the real embrace from their Father in heaven. As crazy as that sounds, it looks just like us, maybe, who have lost a loved one saying, man, I just want to hug that picture. I just want to gaze on the picture some more, the painting a little bit more, rather than saying, no, I want the real thing. And so I think while we look at this perspective, we look back in history and we think, man, that sounds crazy. <laughs> Why would they do that? <laughs> we are no different. I think, man, there's so many things that we look at that we are fixing our focus on things that are temporary, and we chase after things that are building something that is temporary. And it might even be something from our past that we think is, is good and real, but I just really want to challenge us with thinking through this reality. Where in our lives are we exchanging the real, genuine interaction with God our Father through Christ in this new covenant relationship with the copy and a shadow and some thing that we have set up that will never come close to the real thing. Where have we been just serving like the priest at that temporary temple, going through the motions? And this is what I'm supposed to do. We're doing a great thing. It's, it's wonderful. Or is it an empty practice based upon obligation? Or is it truly that heartfelt response because we know that we are serving and chasing after a God who is real and desires to interact with us, really? In our giving, think about it. Are we just going through the motions, writing the check, dropping it in an envelope, or sending it to, to the church, or dropping it through the crack in the door, or whatever, if somebody's not here? or off to a missionary? Is it just something we're doing because that's what we've been instructed to do by law, by our understanding? Or again, is it 
bearing witness to the generosity of our God in heaven. Trying to give a glimpse or a foreshadowing of someone else, to someone else, of what God's generosity in heaven really looks like. In our, in our marriages, and that's a great illustration of God and, and, the, and the church and how we interact and how God gave himself for the church and how the church, the bride of Christ, surrenders to, to God the Father. And so husband and bride, does it look like the genuine relationship of Christ and his church? Or where have we represented it in such a way, even though it's a copy and a foreshadowing, have we just made it look like, man, this beautiful painting, and we've taken it with jello and tried to finger paint it, when we have better tools at our disposal, and we have better wisdom and discernment at our disposal to really proclaim the picture that God has in mind for marriages in this land, and where, do we, where are we using that illustration to really proclaim to the world the picture that Christ has intended for all of eternity with those who would surrender to him. The teachings of Christ in our life with our words, where, I mean, just try to evaluate. Does it look simply like a, a poor copy? <laughs> Something off the mimeograph from ages past? Or does maybe every day we begin to implement and understand a little bit more and so that copy becomes clearer and clearer, the representation becomes clearer and clearer to the world that we're in, and so that someday the copy can be exchanged for the original. Now I want us to think just here with the few moments we have left. Um, Maybe there's someone specifically, these red chairs scattered throughout the room. If you've been here since the beginning of the year, you kind of know what that represents. If not, this is uh, new for you. But these chairs represent people in our communities, in our families, in our lives that have never come to, as this text says, know the Lord. Or have never had the, the, the understanding of God's laws written on their heart who've never come to, as it says in verse 12, understand God's mercy and forgiveness and how it remembers sin no more. So I want you to, if that name has been the same name consistently, I want you to just continue to spend some time praying that man, they, would, they would understand the mercy and the forgiveness and how God has remembered their sin and no more. And and how you can be a witness, and even though it's maybe a copy or a foreshadowing of God's ultimate picture that he has in store for them, that you'd be able to be, bear witness, just as the temple bore witness, that we might be able to bear witness to something that is greater and more superior. And continue to pray for that person, pray for them. Maybe that chair for you has represented someone who is struggling, maybe it's physically, um, I want you to think of maybe specifically, challenge you to think of someone maybe as you look and, and we're evaluating, man, they're just struggling spiritually. You might even have asked them one time, like, how's it going spiritually? And they said, man, I'm in a dry land. I'm in a desert. Or they may, I mean, the first audience would say, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Spend some time really praying for them this week. But I also want us to think of each and every one of the blue chairs, this representing us. How can we encourage one another, pray for one another? I think of someone each day this week. Maybe more names each day this week. <laughs> encourage, lift them up in prayer that we as the church would never be tempted or give up, just as we see this writer warning the Christians uh, here in this day and time, not to seek out a copy or an imitation of Christ in his church or the interactions with our brothers in Christ on a superficial way, but to continue to pursue 
that which is genuine faith in Christ as we wait for the fulfillment of God's ultimate promise to come again. Where we see that picture completely transitioned into the full and real thing. And we want that for every person who walks on the face of this earth. That's our desire. That's why our missions that we support, that drives them. Uh, Our desire as we leave this place as a church should be that each person would be able to see a glimpse of the foreshadowing of the picture that Christ has in store for them so that one day they can actually see it and exchange it for it. They can see that better, more superior, excellent covenant established and realized. Because apart from Christ, we'll not only just keep holding on to the copy in the picture, but we'll see that picture completely disintegrate and burn before our eyes. So this is why it's important, church, to be understanding of God's word, to be encouraged in God's word, and continue to bear witness to the word of God and truth, wherever he places us. And I challenge you to it. I'm going to invite you to stand. And whatever your decision is, maybe you're here today and you want to know more about this new covenant or this clearer picture. You want to get a clearer picture of what eternity with Christ looks like. We'd be happy to have that conversation. Uh, Maybe it's joining uh, Christ and seeking surrender and repentance or uh, immersion in Christ through the waters of baptism Whatever the step is you need to make today, uh, maybe it's just time of prayer because you're needing that encouragement. We invite you to come right down front here. Take that step this direction, and uh, we'll pray, and we'll we'll talk, we'll uh, encourage one another. Um, But let's, let's pray together as we close. Father in heaven, thank you for the picture that you have given us. Uh, Forgive us, Father, when we have looked at your word and we have seen what it is and we have have said, no, I just want to hold on to that which is temporary. I just want to go back to what was familiar. I like kind of the practices and things that I used to do. And we have, in an essence, traded the temporary for the eternal. And and so, Father, forgive us in that. But, Lord, bring us to a greater understanding of this picture. Uh, Give us just a greater understanding of the old covenant that you established and and a greater awareness that you you did not fail. You did not come short But because we did, you took an additional step and you fulfilled that picture in a way that goes beyond our imagination so that one day we can see what Moses saw. And so, Lord, thank you for giving us this text, this picture, this charge. Uh, Help us to continually be reminded of our mission be reminded that we ourselves have been forgiven and that you remember our sin no more and that for those who are apart from you, that's the invitation to come and to understand mercy and forgiveness. And so, Father, thank you for this time, for this body of believers and your church globally. May you be honored and praised as we go from this place. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Have a great week, church.